we're going tonight to Galilee. And we want to begin with a little bit of a geographical lesson, if you'll allow me, please. <clears throat> Over on the extreme right, you see, they are the extreme left, rather, of course, that's the Mediterranean Sea. In your Bible map, it'll say the Great Sea. And then if we come across the bottom third of the map, we see the north shore of the Dead Sea. Right there it is. And if we happen to go about 18 miles straight west, we have the city of Jerusalem. There it is. Now we go back to the north end of the Dead Sea, and we follow the Jordan River north. By the way, it's only 60 miles, but because the Jordan winds and wanders, so it's a distance. If you're going to float it on an inner tube, it's 200 miles. That's more than a day's journey. <laughs> and then we see the kidney-shaped waters of the beautiful Sea of Galilee. So let's get there, shall we? It is beautiful beyond description. This is Mount Hermon. This is the tallest mountain in all of the Middle East. It has upon its peaks eternal snows. And this is the south side of the mountain that we're looking at. The snow melts and runs down the south side into two large creeks which confluence, come together at the south end and form the waters of the Jordan River. It's 12 miles then from the confluence down to the north shore of Galilee, and that's where we're going to go after we have a view from the top. This, ladies and gentlemen, is the ski area for the Middle East, and folks from all over Palestine come here, and, and some folks are allowed to cross the border if they have the right papers and, and the right relationships. In the summertime, folks come here to just ride the chairlifts up to the top because from the top of this mountain, you have a wonderful view into the Bekaa Valley of Syria and looking on to the north and the west into Beirut, Lebanon, and the beautiful waters that front it. And then if you look to the south, you can see the Dead Sea and beyond that to the south and east over into Jordan. Now, we're going to look at the beautiful waters. The waters of the Jordan River are pure because they're the result of snow melt and ice melt. And they're filled with trout. And not too very far from here, by the way, is the place where Jesus was baptized. Here it is, where this river makes a big bend. And in late fall, when most all of the snow has melted off the slopes of Mount Hermon, there is sufficient water here in this bend in order to immerse. And that's why we believe the Bible says that John was baptizing at a place called Anon. And Jesus, the record of Matthew 3 and John 3 tells us, came here and was baptized by John the Baptist. And you remember John the Baptist was very reluctant. He said, no, you need to baptize me. But Jesus said, no, this needs to be done to fulfill righteousness. Now, we have gone to the south end of the Sea of Galilee, and we've stopped at the only village around the lake shore. And that's a surprise in many ways. You would think that because this is such a beautiful body of water, that there would be little villages or subdivisions all around it, and that's not the case at all. This is the only village, and this is Tiberius. It was named originated and named by Herod the Great 20 years before the birth of Jesus in honor, of course, of Tiberius Caesar. Now, our Lord Jesus preached in all of the other villages around here except Tiberius. He didn't preach here. All of the other villages rejected Jesus, and in some places they tried to take his life, and we're going to mention it when soon we get up to Capernaum. Jesus said to the other villages, you're going to be brought low, and they're all gone, all gone with this one exception. And perhaps it's simply because Jesus didn't preach here. Now, this village that we're looking at is the ancient part that dates back hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years, and this fronts the Sea of Galilee. New, the new Tiberius, where the condominiums are and the townhouses are, well, that's back a little bit to the west. I like to refer to the Galilee Sea area as the Disneyland of the Middle East, of Palestine for sure, because this is the center of their recreation. Not only do they come here to fish and to water ski and do other kinds of water sports, 
but they also come here to enjoy games and rides, and there are lots of beautiful, beautiful motels with luscious rooms and swimming pools and all of that sort of thing here. So this, in my mind at least, is the, the Disneyland, the Disney World, really, of the Holy Land. Now you'll see some boats out on the water, and they're tugging at anchors. Those are the same kinds of boats, they say, the same style that were here when Jesus began to choose from this area His disciples. Peter, James, John, Andrew, and most of the other of the twelve, with a couple of exceptions, were in the fishing business here, and they fished from little boats just like these. The difference now, of course, is that these boats have Honda outboard motors. They know what's good out here, don't they, huh? Uh, nothing quite like that little Honda engine, I guess. Well, we're going to get aboard this boat and make a journey some nine miles north up to the ruins of Capernaum. Now, let me tell you a little bit about the configuration of the Sea of Galilee, because you may find it interesting. It is 12 miles long, and it is about uh, four miles wide at the widest point, and it is kidney-shaped. And so we're going to get on some four miles north from the extreme southern portion of the sea, and we're going to make an eight, eight and a half mile journey up to the area of Capernaum. And as we do that, we're going to see folks enjoying the water. We're going to see some folks that are water skiing and, and others on out there are fishing, and it might even remind you of some folks here on your own beautiful lake. Not so very different, really, from this area. Now we have moved up to the north and east shore, and every time I look at this picture, I'm reminded of the time that a guy who'd stolen something from his brother snuck off from right over in there. You remember who that was? He stole his brother's birthright. Yeah. His name was Jacob, and that means the deceiver, the supplanter, says the Bible. And then later, after he repented and... Uh, and given his heart completely to God, God renamed him and called him Israel. Well, they say that it's not too very far over to the east, which of course is to our right, that Jacob wrestled with the angel and said, I won't let you go until you bless me. And then when he came back, after being those many, many years working for his father-in-law off in the far country, he entered the Holy Land, they believe, right about in this same area. We're going to begin to move across to the north and the west, and see some of the ruins. Among them is a beautiful little Catholic chapel. But that's really all that remains here except for ruins. We go on now over toward the west, and we come to the place called St. Peter's House. Can we be positive that this is where Peter lived? No. Is there a good possibility? Yes, there is. For the historical tradition goes way, way back that these remains, these ruins, that this is the spot of Peter's home. Now, I want to remind you about the experience between Jesus and Peter when Jesus called him. You'll remember? He said to Peter, come, and I'll make you a fisher of men. And Peter was likely scraping the barnacles from the boat, or perhaps he was repairing the nets. Peter might well have said, you know, Lord, <clears throat> I'll tell you what, if I scrape the barnacles clean and repair the nets and do a really good job and give her a fresh coat of paint and trim the sails, I'll sell her for a few extra dollars and I'll have those dollars to put in the offering. And so I'll come and join you in a week or so. But you know what the Bible says about Peter and Matthew? It says straightway. That's the King James. That means right now. Right now. He turned and walked away and began to follow Jesus. And I'd like to say to my heart and all of yours tonight, that really is the only way to do it. When we hear the voice of Jesus calling us, we need to do it right now. That's the best and the safe way. Well, I want to tell you something else that happened here then. Peter's mother-in-law had not been well for a good while. And so Peter said, um, Lord, I know you can do it. Would you heal my mother-in-law? And Jesus did that right here. Now we're going to begin to move on across toward the west, and we're going to come to the ruins of an ancient temple. Jesus preached in the temple here. Was this temple the one? No, but it's built on the exact same spot. This one dates about 
200 years after the time of Jesus. But in the courtyard, there are some tiles, some, some flooring of the original temple that was there when Jesus preached and taught inside this temple. And we'll go over and, and see them, and, and I'll allow you to reach out and touch one of them if you'd like. But before we go there, I want you to notice the lintel beam. This was the main entry. And into that beam, there are carved some palm trees. And I want to just point something out to you. The one over on your left-hand side, you'll see, is in a natural state. Its limbs or fronds are out in a natural sort of a way. But the one on the opposite side is very different from that. The palm fronds and limbs are tucked hard against the main branch, uh, the stump part of the tree. And that was to give a warning and tell a story. It was to suggest to everyone that went inside that while inside the house of God, they offer a prayer for the fishermen upon the Sea of Galilee. For down south and on the west side, there is what is called the Pigeon's Gulf. Others refer to it as the knife cut or the pie cut. And it is pie shaped. Or perhaps a better illustration would be taking a big slice out of a layer cake, a German chocolate. Yeah, you know, stop, huh? I see some of you begin to salivate, and I'm feeling the same way. But in any event, that cut goes clear over to the Mediterranean Sea, and without warning, the gusts of wind would come off of the big sea, the great Mediterranean, and right through here and hit this lake without any warning whatsoever. And many a sailor lost his life because he was out in the deep part or out a good ways from shore when his little boat was hit by the wind and knocked over. And so this then a reminder to be sure to pray for good weather and for good luck for the fishermen. And we're going to then begin to move on inside. There are some of those tiles that they say date back to the time of Jesus. And they'll allow you to go right over and touch them. And then you can go home and say, I touched where the feet of Jesus may have walked. If any of you ever get a chance to go to the Holy Land, and right now it's not the safest place to go, I, I feel a necessity to say that to you, but maybe things will get better again in a few months. I was asked not very long ago, are you going to take another group out soon? And I said, no, I'm not, because, uh, because of the safety precautions that I feel um, I'm not comfortable with right now. But if ever you get a chance when things are more peaceable, go to the Holy Land. I mean, if you have to put off buying another car for a while or, or whatever you have to do, do it because your Bible will never be the same. I mean, every time you read something from either Old or New Testament, you're going to have a picture of it when you read the passage, you see? Whether it's from Isaiah and, and where he lived and worked or where Jesus walked or from where he called the disciples or the temple in Jerusalem. And that will come out then as you share with your kids or with your, your class, your Bible class, or wherever. You'll never be the same after your trip to the Holy Land. And so I encourage everyone, certainly Bible workers and pastors and that sort of thing, to do the journey, make the trip, do the, do the journey. We believe that it was about here that Jesus sat down and any time Jesus sat, it seems, the little children came. Have you known people like that? Peggy's daddy was like that. I mean, as soon as he would come home, drive up in front of the house, get out of his old logger's pickup, the neighbor kids would come, and they'd bring their little dogs and their kitties, and he'd tease and play with them, and, and they loved him. And Jesus was like that. He had that same kind of an attraction for little children. And so he sat down and children came to him. And the record is that some of the disciples tried to put them away. No, don't, don't let these kids bother Jesus. And Jesus said, no, allow them to come to me. Don't prevent them. For they are the essence of the kingdom of God. Except you all become as little children. Yeah. And so I can see Jesus taking a child on his knee and in that context and from right here, Jesus said, if anyone harms a child, if anyone abuses a child, it'd be better for that person to have a millstone hanged round his, her neck and be cast overboard 
into the depths of the sea. Now, the illustrations of Jesus really plugged in because the Galilee Sea at the time of Jesus was called bottomless. That simply meant that no one had enough string on which to tie a rock and touch the bottom out in the middle. We know how deep today with sonar and radar and all of that sort of thing, but it's very, very deep. And so Jesus said, you'd be better if you abuse a child to be thrown overboard with a millstone round your neck. Now, about the 15 yards from where Jesus is sitting with a child on his knee, there are some millstones. You see that? Look with me. Here's the main grindstone right here. And there is the center pin. And then there is the grind wheel with the hole in the center of it. And they would attach a little donkey, by the way, with a pole to this wheel. And they would pour their grain through the hole and fall down in there. And then the little donkey go round and round and round, chasing that corn cob, you know. <laughs> and uh, I've known some... Uh, I've known... I'm from Idaho. <laughs> I've known some Idahoans that go a long ways for a good ear of corn. This old boy's one of them, I'll tell you that. But in any event, can you imagine? Jesus says, you know, we'll put that, um, that stone, put your head through that hole, and then put you overboard. You're going to go down, as they say in Idaho, in a quick hurry, huh? And so these illustrations of Jesus really plugged in. They locked in, and they made a great deal of sense. Around the millstone, there are the colanders for making grape juice. And this is a very fruitful and productive area with all of the water and the fertile soil here. And so you can see those colanders into which the grapes would be placed and then those pointed affairs that would um, fit down inside and be pressed and then the juice would come out through the hole into the container. Well, let's move on, shall we? We've moved down south on the west shore and we come again to a little chapel. It seems that just about any time something happened in the narrative of Jesus, his life and times, that they would build a little church around it, and that's what they've done here. I found myself, and this I don't mean to be prejudicial at all, but I found myself wishing that they might have just left it plain like it was when Jesus was there and instead of building the little churches and that sort of thing. But this is a beautiful little chapel. We're not going to go inside, but rather we're going to go around behind so that I can give you folks a real good look at the blue waters of the Galilee Sea, looking over some evergreen here. Now, it's from this vantage point, it's from right in here that Jesus preached the Sermon on the Mount. You read that in Matthew chapters 5 and 6 and 7, and the Beatitudes and all were spoken by our Lord Jesus from here. But I want to take your minds to another event or two. Jesus got in a boat with his disciples to go to the other side because it was quieter over there. There were fewer people on the other side, and it was lush and green and park-like and a good place to go and maybe have a lunch or just take a quiet nap. Evidently, Jesus was very tired because soon after he'd gotten in the boat and with the waves gently rocking, Jesus went to sleep. And they got out in the middle, and you know what happened, don't you? There came one of those violent storms, probably through the Pigeon's Gulf that we just alluded to a bit ago. And the white caps came, and then the rollers, and then the ship was being tossed on its beam's ends, and the disciples cried out, Lord, save us, wake up and do something. And Jesus stood up and simply said, Peace be still. And the waters went flat. You know, my dears, if you're having problems in your life, in your relationships, at the workplace, if you're worried and stressed, Jesus can say to your heart and to your worries, be still. Rest a while. We're living in a troubled time. I'm going to talk more about it tonight as we study from our Bible and from the prophecies of Jesus and the Revelation. We're living in difficult times, and we have some more difficult days ahead. 
But I want you folks to be certain that the same Jesus who calmed the storms and said to the seas, peace be still and the waves, hush up. That same Jesus still has his hand on the wheel. He's still in charge. He's in control. And that brings us peace, whether we're at the workplace or putting our heads to the pillow at the end of the day. Now let me tell you of a couple of things that have happened here. One at the time of Jesus. Jesus with his disciples went across on a peaceful day and they got over to the other side and there is a cemetery. I'm going to point to it for you. There's a little bit of a canyon right in there and some flat ground and there's a cemetery. And as they were pulling the boat up onto the shore, a couple of guys came out from amongst the graves and they were demon possessed and they were intent on doing violence to Jesus. You remember the story, don't you now? They were going to just rip the disciples apart. I mean, these guys were crazed. And Jesus said to the demons, who are you? And you remember the answer? We are exactly so. We are legion. That means the old devil has around us not one or two evil angels, but a host to trouble our lives and torment us. And Jesus said then, leave this man alone. And the demons vacated the men. And you remember where they went? Sure you do. They went into a herd of pigs. And the pigs ran up on the crazy as the men had been. The pigs went up on the cliff above and they jumped off over the cliff into the sea and they drowned. And then the farmers blamed Jesus, you know. They wanted him to pay insurance money, I suppose, don't you? Yeah, it's kind of like blaming the weatherman for the weather, really, isn't it? All right. So that happened right over there. Now, I want to tell you about something else, though, that has happened in more recent times. Those cliffs that we're looking at, and I think we have another pic. There is a better picture, perhaps. Those hills over there, ladies and gentlemen, are the Golan Heights. For years and years and years, they were called the Golan Heights, of Syria, the Bekaa Valley we've referred to, Syria. And Syria has not been a friendly neighbor to Palestine, to the Israeli, to the Jew. In fact, there is ter terrible, terrible hatred. And Syria has been behind a great amount of the terrorism that we believe has um, resulted with Hezbollah and, and other related groups, probably to include Al-Qaeda. But in any event, up atop those hills and those bluffs, the Syrians had some big guns, some big anti-aircraft guns. And they would get in war with the Israelis just about every other week. And when the Israeli jets would fly over, they would try to shoot them down. But those jets had been made in the United States, and those Israeli jet fighter pilots had been trained, if not in the United States, by the United States, and they were among the very finest in all the world. And, and so the, the folks over there with the big guns, they couldn't hit the jets. So you know what they did? They aimed those big guns at the schools of the, Palest of, of the Jewish people over on this side, the kindergarten, the preschool, and the first and second, third graders. And when classes took up and the kids were all there, they would blow the schools apart and it happened again and again and again. And the leadership of the peoples of Israel complained bitterly at the United Nations and other organizations. They said, stop this, do something. And nothing was done. Nothing was done. And so finally, after this had gone on for years, the Marines, and that's the best way I know how to relate it to your mind, the Marines of the nation of Israel said, we're going to do something about it. Would you remember a leader that they had for many years who had an eye patch? He'd lost an eye in battle and he wore an eye patch. You remember his name? Moshe Dayan, of course. Moshe Dayan took uh, a group of men, not unlike the Navy SEALs. Maybe that's even a better sort of an illustration. He put them in rubber boats 
and they started across the water right here. And by the time they were just offshore here, they were under a withering fire. And it reminded me a little bit of the beachhead at Normandy in World War II. But they continued through the fire, and the majority of them made it, and they scaled the cliffs over on the other side and threw dynamite in the bunkers and took out those guns and held the ground, and they have continued to hold it. And the Syrians say, it's not fair, and there will never be peace in the Middle East until you give back the Golan Heights. And the Israelis say, as surely as we give them back, you're going to blow our schools up, and we're not going to do it. So this is just, again, a part of the problem out in the Middle East that I think will not find solution until Jesus comes again, and he is going to come because we're going to have solution. We must have it. Shall we move on just a little bit? There's a sign that says to us, ice cream, Alaskan ice cream. Now, the temperatures I alluded to you yesterday are about 120, 125 degrees, and they also advertise ice-cold Coca-Cola. Say, that's good advertising. That would really bring the dollars out of your pockets. Look at the rest of the menu up there. Bible foods, Mount of Olives oil, Cane of Galilee wine, Cane of Galilee grape juice, Samarian fig, St. John's honey, and Sea of Galilee sardines. Are you hungry now? No, just for the ice cream. That's what I thought. Now, out in front of the little church where they say Jesus multiplied the loaves and the fishes, there is another of those big grind wheels there, grindstones. But we want to go inside to notice the little altar, there is a stone beneath that altar, and they say that Jesus sat upon that stone when the little boy's lunch was brought to him, and he blessed it and multiplied it. And down in front in the mosaic, some of you perhaps are able to see, there's a little basket with some uh, loaves in it, some biscuits, and the fishes over here on either side. The multiplication of the loaves and fishes. You can imagine, can't you now, Jesus beginning to speak here, and the crowds come, and they continue to come and press. And finally, there are so many that Jesus has to get in the boat and push offshore a little ways. And he speaks to them, as is recorded in Matthew chapters 5, 6, and 7, from the Sermon of the Mount. And the people wouldn't go home. And uh, a couple of hours, and the folks st are still there. And by now, the little children certainly are getting hungry. And still, their parents are more hungry for spiritual food, and they stay. And finally, Jesus sends his disciples out, see if there's anything that can be eaten. And it's Andrew who finds a little guy with his lunch. And he asks, uh, would you be willing to share? And he, they take that to Jesus, and he multiplied it. And the Bible says they fed 5,000 but that only counted the men, including the women and children. Probably there were 15 or 20,000 who were miraculously fed that day. And that same Jesus is well able to take care of all of our needs and feed our kids and take care of our families as well. Well, we need to come to a conclusion here tonight. I want to thank you very much for being on time to travel. He's got a gun, they said. He's got a gun. He's in the back seat with a rifle. The police in Rochester, New York in 1993, surrounded a car. And indeed, in the back seat, there was a guy with a rifle. And they surrounded him from some safe distance. They began to shout through the megaphones, come out, leave the weapon, come out with your hands up. And nothing happened. They got closer and were now with their shields. Come out, come out, leave the gun, get out. And nothing happened. They attempted then to negotiate and brought in the psychiatrist and nothing happened. They would talk to the person in the back seat, and there was no answer. They decided to watch and wait and wait and watch. And after some long while, they decided they would do the rush in, and they did that, and they smashed the windows, and they reached in. And in the back seat with the rifle was a mannequin. <laughs> when they found the owner of the automobile, they asked, what is your purpose? What are you doing here? You've caused some problems. Well, he said, um, I keep him back there for protection. It's safer when I drive through the hood. They, they're not so anxious to hijack my car. We live in dangerous times, ladies and gentlemen. There's no doubt about that. These are difficult days, and there's some more that are coming. And there is a need for protection. And I want to assure you tonight that we're going to be under the protective arm of our Lord Jesus. We're going to talk about some difficulties but we're going to always leave with the reassurance that we're under the umbrella 
of God Almighty. We're going to share some good news some bad news and some sometimes really bad news and then always we shall conclude with some wonderful news. Would you please open your Bibles with me to Matthew chapter 24. Matthew chapter 24 as we alluded last night finds our Lord Jesus answering a question of his disciples. They said, Lord, tell us what is it going to be like when you come and at the end of the world and spell it down for us in very careful and childlike detail. And so Jesus began to tell them, it's going to be like this and this and this and this. I'm going to take up the reading, ladies and gentlemen, tonight at verse 29. And we'll read through to verse number 33. All right? Matthew's Gospel, chapter 24. The Sermon on Last Day Events, Begin, beginning to read at verse 29. Immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun is going to be darkened and the moon will not give her light. And the stars are going to fall from the heavens, the powers of the heavens are going to be shaken, and then there's going to appear in the heavens a son of man. And all those upon the earth are going to mourn, those who are not ready, when they see him coming in the clouds with power and with great glory. He's going to send his angels with the sound of a great trumpet, and he's going to gather his elect from the four points of the compass, from one end of the heaven to the other. Now learn this parable, the parable of the fig tree. When the branches are still tender and are putting forth their leaves, know that summer is coming near. So likewise, when you see these things approaching, know that the end is near, even at the doors. I had a first cousin who was there. He was logging nearby to where it happened, Snowflake, Arizona. Some of you perhaps know where it is, just a little bit to the east and perhaps a bit north of Flagstaff, Arizona, in the mountains and in the timber. Six loggers were returning from a day's work in the logging camps, driving together in what loggers called the crummy or the man wagon, when suddenly there was an unidentified flying object that landed in the logging road right in front of them, blocked their path. It stayed there, and the men in the vehicle stayed in their seats. But one of them, braver perhaps than the others, got out. His name was Travis Walton. He got out and went over near, and as he went near to the spacecraft, it lifted up and lifted up somewhere, he believed, to about 100 feet. He walked directly beneath it, and he was sucked up inside. Strange story, strange situation. Yeah, did it really happen? I don't know. All I can tell you is what I do know of the rest of the story. The six loggers all took and passed polygraph tests. They said it really happened. This story was first turned into a book and then into a movie. And the federal guest investigator who played the part, um, I should say the actor who played the part of the federal investigator was none other than Norman, Oklahoma native James Garner, an Oscar winner. He said before he took on the challenge of the movie, before he signed any contract, he met with those loggers, including the one that said he was taken up in the flying object. And he said, and I quote, I came away entirely believing their story. Signs in the heavens, UFOs, strange things going on. I'm going to tell you my own personal experience, mine and Peggy's and our families in a broader way. It was 1974 and Peggy and I were holding meetings very like these in Twin Falls, Idaho. When Wednesday came, we had no meeting and so we decided we would go home on Tuesday night, do the laundry and catch up on a few things. Our home was in Boise, a distance of 120 miles. I'd had a hard day and I was lying down in the back seat of our old Cadillac and Peggy was up front driving. And as she got somewhere around 35 miles north and along the rim of the Snake River Canyon, she shouted at me, look, would you look over the river? And I got up wide awake now and I looked and there above the river hovering was something with a very, very bright light. We stopped and rolled the windows down, and we heard nothing at all. And then suddenly, and with no noise, the thing began to move. Rapidly it moved, and then it stopped and hovered again. And then suddenly it was gone. In the Yukon, to move north a ways, in 1996, there were 
31 civil engineers who were working up toward the oil, pipe country, oil pipeline country when a huge flying object unidentified landed near to the service station where they were and stayed there for at least one hour. They also took lie detector tests. They also passed. And these are not calamity howlers. These are not the kind of guys that are seeking five minutes of fame. These are men that are trustworthy. These are men that come from good Christian homes and families and from good backgrounds. And they all told the same story. And then more recently, it was in Ely, Nevada. And I thought about this when about seven days ago, Peg and I drove through on our way from Phoenix to here. The Smith brothers, some while back, decided early one morning to go into town to get some feed and some other farm supplies, veterinary supplies, so they could get back to their cattle ranch in time to do still a day's work. It was 4.30 in the morning, they said, when it landed in the highway, on the pavement, in the highway, right on the center line and in front of them, and it stayed there bright as daylight, they said, with lights flashing all the way around. They said we were frightened enough to stay inside. It remained for several minutes and then suddenly took off without any sound and faster than we could imagine. When the brother Smith got into Ely and went into the restaurant and into the sheriff's department to tell their story, no one laughed at them. These were real cowboys. These were guys that weren't seeking fame or fortune but told it just like it was, and like it is. They're still talking about it in Phoenix. They were when I was there. It happened on March the 13th of 1997 over Camelback Mountain. How many of you know about Camelback Mountain in Phoenix? Yeah, a bunch of you do, of course. For your interest's sake and those of you who don't know, that is the area where the mucky mucks live. That's the way we say it in Idaho. That's the area where the rich and the upper middle class, that's where the executives of Motorola industry live. And they have huge homes there around the mountain. And they have huge swimming pools in the backyard. And they have fountains in the front yard. This is not some ghetto or a slum. The sisters, Monica Bush and Aaron Watson, were on television again just a few days ago reciting what had happened. They were over visiting their parents that evening. They said it was one of those beautiful spring nights when the skies were clear and the stars were so close it seemed you could reach up and touch them. And then they said it came over the Camelback Mountain silently. It hovered right above our parents' home and stayed there making absolutely no noise. And by the way, for those of you with a scientific background, this whole phenomenon of these flying machines making no noise at all, it's called now magnetodynamics. I've got to do some more research in that area because I personally find it interesting. It stayed there for the longest time, and then suddenly it moved away. There was no flight pattern. There were no jets who were flying that area. This is not in the path of Sky Harbor Airport. But after several minutes, it suddenly flew away. There have been many professional witnesses, not only just commoners and loggers, but professional witnesses. And there's a man by the name of James Fox who's made a book out of going to interview these, quote, professionals. He's talked to pilots and navigators and men with, the, with lots of stripes from the Navy and from the Air Force. His book, Out of the Blue, is now, as we speak, being made into a movie. More recently, Stevensville, Texas. I was holding meetings, as I mentioned, down in Phoenix, Arizona, when this happened in Stevenville, Texas. By the next night, Larry King Live was on top of the story, and the following night, Bill O'Reilly highlighted and headed with it as well. There were over a thousand people who saw it there. It went across the little town and then returned. And as it returned, the jets of the Air Force began to give it chase. Military jets chased the thing, they said, for about seven minutes. The sheriff saw it happen. I have a buddy who lives about three miles away. He's a retired banker by the name of Ernie. His wife's name is Barbara. And as soon as I got the news of what had happened there, I called my friends down in Texas and asked if they were okay and had they been caught up or sucked up inside the machine. Zoomed me up, huh, Scotty? No. It's happening, folks. 
It's happening everywhere. A pilot, commercial pilot by the name of Steve Allen was there, and he saw it, and he described it. He said, my estimation is that the things were going at about 2,000 miles per hour, and it was silent as an empty tomb while it flashed the bright lights. Fairly recently, there was, held in Washington, D.C., a UFO conference High leaders, men of high rank from all of the armies really of the world were there to discuss and to have a look and to share ideas. A Belgian general was, it seems, the most vocal when he came away shaking his head and saying, we don't know what's going on. We just don't know. In mid-America, a state trooper was out patrolling in the middle of the night when suddenly his car stalled and then he noticed the object above him when the situation was over and he drove back to the police headquarter, got out and inspected his car and others came out to have a look as well, there were laser tight burns on the car that the scientist said could have been produced by no ordinary heat that is known. U.S. Air Force pilots have, uh, have been witnesses to this kind of thing. The U.S. Air Force itself has spent multiplied millions looking into it, and they really don't have any answers. They share some suggestions. I'll share one or two of those. They say one thing is uh, the possibility of optical illusion, that there are things out there, objects real enough, perhaps a jet airliner, when in the certain r light and in just the certain sort of a, a array from off of a cloud or some such thing, it could seem to be an unidentified object, but it's really something that we know and understand very well. Another cause, they say, is the possibility of swamp gas. Swamp gases in certain places at certain times can, at night especially, fluoresce and give off, off gases that are not only fluorescent but incandescent as well. More than that, many of the reports come from disordered minds. And that's not a surprise to us. Not everyone has a good handle on everything that's going on. Uh, you heard about the guy that said, you know, I don't quite know what's going on, and my brother ain't even suspicious. <laughs> and so there's some of that. Uh, there are some folks who drink a little too much and, and puff a little too much from the happy stick, and they give reports like this. On the other hand, some of these things remain absolute mysteries, even to the scientists. I've been asked on more than one occasion, Lyle, what is your belief? What do you think is happening? And my answer is quick and it's clear. I think that something is going on, something we don't yet understand. Do I believe that these are aliens from another people planet? No, I do not. For I do not believe God would allow his created children from an unfallen planet to come here and visit this sin cursed earth. I don't believe he'd allow that to happen. Moreover, God's creations are perfect and they're beautiful. And in the beginning, all of his children were that way until sin came and caused some of us. Well, I'll stop there. We're going to stop right there. In Roswell, New Mexico, you're well aware, there was the report that one of these machines had crashed and, uh, and some of those aboard were killed. And this mystery, I suppose, like the death of John Kennedy, will continue as long as there is time. But the little creatures who were said to have died in the impact were green-looking men with long faces and great big buggy eyes. And I don't believe God made anybody that looked like that. What might it be? I believe that the devil may well be setting us up for the greatest delusion of all time. When he comes to impersonate Jesus, and he's going to do that because our Lord himself said that it's going to happen, it wouldn't uh, be of any import, the warning of Jesus, unless it's going to happen, would it now? And so Jesus said, beware, Antichrist is going to come. When he comes, he's not going to come on the back of a camel. He's going to be more modern than tomorrow's newspaper. Why not come as a representative from some other planet, Jesus perhaps, who's come back from heaven in a spacecraft. Now, the flying saucer phenomenon so far has not been all that dangerous. Really, perhaps it's more humorous and dangerous. That could change at any time, of course. But now I want to transition to something that I believe really is dangerous and real and something that we do well to think about. 
Our Lord Jesus is going to come back, as we said last night, not out of whim or out of caprice, but out of absolute necessity. And for the next three nights, we're going to be talking about these subjects that necessitate the imminent coming of Jesus. If there's anyone left here to save, he's going to have to hurry back, and he's going to do it. I'd like for you next, if you will, please, to read with me from Revelation chapter 1. Revelation chapter 1 contains the key scripture for not only the book of Revelation, the, the chapter 1 of Revelation, but for the whole of the book of Revelation as well. And we're going to note chapter 1 of Revelation, the seventh verse. We said last night, I'll mention while you're turning with me, that the book of Revelation is the last book not by accident. It's for those who live in the last days, just before the last missionary goes over the last hill, and Jesus comes on a rescue mission. And so the theme thought, the verse that is the fulcrum, if you please, for the whole of the rest of the prophecies of Revelation is found in the first chapter and the seventh verse. And here is the way it reads. Look, or behold, it says in the King James, behold, he comes with clouds and every eye shall see him, including also those who pierced him and every kindred of the earth shall wail because of him. Even so, amen. Now I want us without any transitional statement to go from there to a promise of Jesus found in the Gospel of John chapter 14. I encourage you once more to bring your Bibles, and if you don't have one, we'll be happy to help you to get one. John chapter 14 finds his disciples at the end of three years of ministry and instruction and discipling in an upper room. He said to them, I'm going to have to go away. You can't come with me, not now and not yet, and their hearts are broken. And so Jesus speaks in that context words of comfort. You memorized the verses long, long ago, didn't you? Revelation, I'm sorry, John's Gospel, chapter 14, verses 1, 2, and 3, where it says, would you like to say them with me? Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go, I may come back. There's a possibility that I'll come again. Is that what it says? No, it's in the positive. I will come again to receive you unto myself that where I am, there you may be also. Jesus is coming back out of absolute necessity. I want you to go with me, please, to Isaiah chapter 25, because we need to notice real quickly another of these promises from God. Isaiah did his writing about 700 years before the birth of Jesus, and we need to remind ourselves in these times and places of the promises of God. Isaiah chapter 25, and I'm going to be reading at verses 8 and 9. Isaiah 25, beginning to read at verse 8. It says about our God, He will swallow up death in victory. The Lord God is going to wipe every tear from the faces of His children. He's going to rebuke folks and take away from off all of the earth uh, evil from the face of the earth, for the Lord has spoken it. And it shall be said in that day, this is our God. We've waited for him, and he will save us. We've waited so long, we'll be glad and rejoice in his salvation. So here then are the people of God that look up in the sky and see Jesus coming on the rescue mission. This is our God. Now, I want you to go from there to the words of Jesus in Luke chapter 21. Luke chapter 21 along with Matthew 24, Luke 17 are parallels and they talk about end time events. And here in Luke chapter 21, we find our Lord Jesus again speaking to this question of the disciples, what will it be like when you come back? What are events going to be like? How can we know and how can our children's children be ready? And Jesus said it's going to be like this and this and this. Now follow while I read beginning at verse 25. Luke 21 25 and following. There will be signs in the sun, in the moon, in the stars, upon the earth distress of nations, perplexities, the sea with its waves roaring, and men's hearts failing them for fear. We could talk tonight at some length about the rapid increase in heart disease, couldn't we? Stress-related heart disease. It's the number one killer in the United States today among males who are grown and beyond reckless driving. All right, men's hearts are failing them for fear, for looking after the things that are coming upon the earth. The powers of heaven are going to be shaken. And then, verse 27, then they see the Son of Man coming in the cloud with power and great glory. And when you see these things begin, then look up and lift up your heads and know that your redemption draws near. Now let's go to verse, 15, verse 11, I'm sorry. Verse 11, 
from the same passage, and it's really kind of a continuation and relationship. It says, great earthquakes there shall be in various and different places, famines and pestilences, and fearful sights and signs from, now you tell me what it says. I want to talk to you a little bit, ladies and gentlemen, about asteroids, not science fiction. There was a man who recently wrote a book that he entitled The Death of a Star. His name is Neil deGrasse Leeson. He said when a star explodes, it releases tons and tons of radioactive force and flash. And by the way, if you want to know more about his credentials, he's a Ph.D. degree. He is with the American Museum of Natural History, and he has a cohort who agrees and shares with him in his writing. His name is Michael Shera, also a Ph.D., working at the same place. Now I'm quoting from these two men. While watching for gamma rays that might be coming from the former Soviet Union, we found we're getting hit by radiation from outer space much, much more and to a greater degree than we ever realized. We see the death of at least one major star a day. Now, what if one explodes nearby, perhaps in the nearness of our proximity of our own galaxy? If so, we could have two suns in our sky. Moreover, it would deplete instantly all of the ozone layer. The ozone is our only defense against high-energy radiation. And so men of science are suggesting that there are grave possibilities out there that are moving quickly our own way. Now, I want to talk briefly about a connection, and then we'll to move again to the talk of asteroids. How many of you folks can remember where you were when Mount St. Helens blew? Can you remember that day? Yeah. They say when something earth-shaking import happens, you can remember right where you were. Peggy and I were working in meetings like these on the west side of Denver, Colorado, when she blew up. I shall never forget May 18, 8.42 in the morning, 1980. And David Johnson, who pitched his tent several miles off from the north face, went on the radio, Vancouver, Vancouver, this is it. And then he was blown into outer space. One square mile of rock and lava was blown way beyond our own atmosphere. Bill McGuire, professor of geohazards from the University College of London, says... If you think St. Helens was something, just listen. The Earth's crust, he goes on, is only 25 miles deep. And beneath that crust, there is a pressurized uh, ocean of molten rock just looking for a way to escape. And then he begins to talk about Yellowstone Park. Now, I love Yellowstone Park. I felt really badly when the fire destroyed it, but it's rebuilt itself in a beautiful way. And I know many of you go there and love it and enjoy it as well. But this is what he says. There's a potential danger beneath the Yellowstone that could plunge the United States instantly into a total darkness. It, it would be an explosion a thousand times greater than Mount St. Helens. There are 40 such super volcanoes around the globe. If the Yellowstone eruption should happen, it would bury rapid city South Dakota instantly beneath 20 feet of ash and lava. Within a matter of just a few minutes, it could bury the entirety of Wyoming and South Dakota. How would we know that it's happened? We wouldn't, he said, except for the black sky. And then he goes on to say, the only way we'll be able to see such a phenomenon is by the cameras that are way out in outer space, by satellite hookup. It's going to be that big. 30 minutes, it could bury thousands and thousands and thousands of square miles. Now, he said, you must remember, no vehicles will be able to move. No airplanes will be able to sky, fly through the sky lest their engines instantly be choked. By the way, to pause for a moment, can you folks remember? Can you remember those big breathing systems they had to put on the state vehicles? Yeah, this officer knows. Yeah, uh, otherwise that, that looked like talcum powder and you rub it between your fingers and it'd instantly take the skin off. Peggy and I took our boy Troy. I was looking at the pictures just this afternoon. We went up to Mount St. Helens just shortly after it erupted, and that stuff would take the skin off your fingers in an instant almost. There will be no transport of food. There will be shortages. Temperatures are going to be affected worldwide. Now, let's get back to this connection. Because they are connected, the asteroids and the volcanoes and all this kind of weather, a man by the name of Neil deGrasse Lyson, who's an astrophysicist, says, and I'm quoting, we're living in a shooting gallery with wayward asteroids having us right in their sights, right down the gun barrel. Some of these asteroids are as small as sand, others are as big 
as the state of Texas. Now, I want you to leave your minds there and go with me very quickly to Revelation chapter 8. Revelation chapter 8, and I want to read just the 8th verse. Revelation chapter 8 and verse 8, and it says, The second angel sounded, as it were, and, and a great mountain burning with fire was cast into the sea, and a third part of the sea became like blood. Revelation 8, verse 8. Serious times, signs in the heaven, in the sky, sun, moon, stars, unidentified flying objects. But I want to comfort you tonight as we conclude, as I promised I would. I want to tell you that our Lord Jesus is not only our Savior, He is also our Creator. It is He who spoke and planet Earth flashed into its hole in space. It was our Lord Jesus who hung the moon and the stars. And the same Jesus who created planet Earth is still upon the throne. The same Jesus who cast the stars into their dark openings is still in charge. A poet asked, how big is God? How big and wide is vast domain? To try to tell these lips can barely start. But he's big enough. He's big enough to rule his mighty universe. And he's small enough to live within my heart. Let's pray. Without faith, Lord, we don't know how we'd face tomorrow. Thank you for your word. In your word, we see your warnings, but in your warnings, we see your love. When you warned through Noah, you were speaking from a heart of love. When you warned through the folks who were living in Sodom and Gomorrah, you spoke out of a heart of love. And as we read your warnings tonight, we know you're speaking from your heart of love. Give us the good common sense to listen. Instead of being fearful, let us strengthen our relationship with you. We want to know better our Bibles. We want to memorize those promises. But best of all, most of all, we want to really well know the author. Give us this blessing in Jesus' name. Amen.